Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Animus Corporation, providing insulin delivery products for people living with diabetes and part of the One Touch family. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hi, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. You know that if you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. This week, a life's plan to aim high, upended by type 1 diabetes, his dream of the Air Force set aside, Neil Greathouse takes a new path that ends up helping people in an entirely different way. I had an idea, literally woke up in the middle of the night and sat down on the bathroom floor and started writing things out on my phone and I texted a friend of mine who was halfway across the world. I said, I think I have an idea for something. It might really help a lot of people out. Can I call you? We'll talk about that idea, how it's taken off and what's next for Neil. Plus, ice hockey and Type 1, a new NHL program for kids, and a follow-up. A previous guest who travels the world is setting his sights on the U.S. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to Diabetes Connections. I'm Stacey Sims. Glad to have you with me for another week of the podcast. If you're new to the show, welcome. Glad you found us. Here's what we do on Diabetes Connections. We share stories to educate and inspire, talking to people who are doing amazing things while living with type 1, as well as the healthcare companies we rely on, the technology companies that are doing interesting and amazing things. And I also like to talk to people who aren't doing the extreme or the ultimate, but are just trying to live life day to day with type 1. My son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2006, just before he turned 2. So I put myself firmly in the camp of ordinary people just trying to live with this ridiculous condition. Our JDRF walk is this weekend. It is hard for me to believe that that time of year is here again. You know, we go in and out with how much we are involved with the walks. Um, I was on our local JDRF board for six years when Benny, when my son was first diagnosed, and we've always been a big supporter, but sometimes the walk is something we do a lot with, sometimes it's not. For the last couple of years, we've had a group team. There were four kids in Benny's elementary school with type 1, so we got together and made one team. That was the BEAM team, Benny, Ella, Addie, and Michael. Their names spell out BEAM. But they've all moved on, and um, the boys are in middle school. One of the girls moved, so Ella is the only one who's left in this elementary school. So we have joined Ella's team this year, and I'm really excited to be walking with them. It's going to be a lot of fun. Her team name is Ella Friends, and it's a cute little elephant logo. Very clever stuff like that. I also got an email this week from Diabetes Camp that this is the sleepaway camp that they have in our area. It's a one week long program that the American Diabetes Association runs that there are only 20 spots left. So um, it just made me think if you are looking into diabetes camp or diabetes programs for the summer, you need to get on that because, you know, they do fill up and certainly ours is almost to capacity. And I, I found out about um, something that's unique, this is a new NHL program for kids with type 1. Now, it's in Canada, but this is still pretty cool. Uh, the Montreal Canadiens and their sponsor, Sun Life Financial, are putting on a one-week hockey camp for kids with type 1. I think this is really cool because there are all sorts of programs for different sports and for kids to take advantage of. I think this is the first hockey one, and certainly it's the first one from the uh, NHL. So I will be linking it up at diabetes-connections.com if you want to learn more about that. We've had on some great guests before about um, hockey programs in the United States with kids with type 1, and uh, you can link back to that as well. In the main page at diabetes-connections.com, there's a little search box. Just want to make sure you see that. It's very easy to search through our now more than... 100 episodes, really, if you count the bonus episodes that I've done. Put in whatever search term you're looking for, hockey, camp, uh, Disney, uh, you know, Dexcom, pumps, whatever you're looking for. Upper right-hand side on your desktop, there's a little box on mobile. It should be right there at the top. 
and it should pop up with what you're looking for. If you can't find it, just let me know. Stacy at diabetes-connections.com. That's S-T-A-C-E-Y at diabetes-connections.com. And I also want to tell you about another previous guest. Jeremy is a T1D traveler. We spoke to him, I want to say in 2015. He had been living in Asia. He has traveled the world with type 1. He's from the southeast United States, but he has lived abroad uh, for many years. And he is, as we speak, beginning a road trip around the United States from April until July this year, he's visiting national parks, and he's doing this in part to raise money for JDRF, but he's also you know, just showing how much fun travel can be, even with type 1 diabetes. He's really fun. He's got great videos, and we're going to be talking to him as well, but I'll link that up as well. The website is 70-130.com, uh, because that's the range that he likes to be in. But I will definitely link that up at diabetes-connections.com. We've been to a couple of national parks. And my understanding, too, is that we didn't know this at the time, that you can get free admission if you have type 1 diabetes to the national parks. You may have to be under 18. I'll check that and link it up at diabetes-connections.com so you could find out more about that. But cool stuff. And I'll definitely check in with Jeremy because that sounds like a lot of fun and a big undertaking. But hey, at least the, the signs are going to be in English. I think he's used to most of the, the signs around him being not only in another language, but with different characters. <laughs> he's traveled through Russia and Eastern Asia. I mean, it's really interesting guy. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our sponsors. Animus, choosing an insulin pump is an important decision. You know that. And I feel really fortunate. Our certified diabetes educator, really worked with us to educate us about all of our options. She listened to what we wanted in an insulin pump. And after nearly 10 years with Animus, I know it was the right decision. Betty was two when we started with Animus. He's 12. We continue to be impressed with everything, including the stellar customer service. That's why I'm so glad to be able to tell you about our experience and why I'd really urge you to learn more about Animus insulin pumps. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Animus, part of the One Touch family logo. My guest this week is Neil Greathouse. He has quite a story, and we're going to talk about it. But what caught my attention initially was his Instagram feed. He is the Beaties on Instagram. Um, he does videos. He does one just about every day about type 1. They are short. They are funny. They are sometimes a little crazy. Um, here's a little bit of what I'm talking about. Why, hello there. Today's November 15th, it's National Diabetes Awareness Day. You know how I know? Because Google has it on their website. And that's where I get all my pertinent information. I don't know what you decided to do today, if you had some fun-filled plans, or maybe you decided you wanted to sit down and contemplate diabetes and insulin and all of that. Me? I decided to drop my insulin pump in the water and ruin it forever. So it doesn't work, doesn't function, the buttons don't work, none of it works. It's absolutely a paperweight right now, and I am waiting for a new one to come in the mail. And so I just thought, you know what, today I'm just gonna sit here and contemplate and just think and let my feelings go, okay? <laughs> See you tomorrow. Neil cracks me up. And you'll you'll hear more in the interview that um, he why he started doing videos like that and which are his favorite, because as you can imagine, he does get some interesting reactions. You know, social media is funny. I fought I fought Instagram for a while. Um, it just seems inevitable now that you have to be everywhere. And this week, too, they update. I don't even understand Facebook. They have stories now. Instagram has stories like what they took from the kids. The kids tell me um, it's what they took from Snapchat. Look, it is all I can do to try to stay where I am. So you can find me, Stacey Sims, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And then Diabetes Connections is on Twitter and Facebook as well. But I, I mean, I, I think I admire so much people like Neil who are able to really use social media in these great ways because you know he's helping people. And then I laugh at myself because I'll try to do something on Pinterest and I get 
I get terrified because there's just too many pictures and everybody's perfect and I have to run away. Okay, more with Neil coming up. But first, a word from Dexcom. And as you know, we've been dealing with type 1 for a decade now. You know, I'd heard about the teen years, but like a lot of parents of young children, I thought we'd be different. Ha ha ha! <laughs> I mean, right? Here we are, and here come some incredible physical changes and wild hormone swings. I cannot imagine managing diabetes during this crazy time without the Dexcom Continuous Glucose Monitoring System. We can react more quickly to highs and lows, adjust insulin doses with advice from our endocrinologist. I know the G5 Mobile is helping to improve Benny's A1C. CGM-based treatment requires finger sticks for calibration, may result in hypoglycemia if calibration not performed or symptoms expectations do not match CGM readings. For more information, go to Dexcom.com. Neil Greathouse is very funny, he's very creative, and you know he's helping a lot of people with those Instagram videos. I mean, I've sent them to friends when I know they're having a tough time or to show how to do something. But when Neil was diagnosed, he was on a completely different track. I mean, he wasn't making funny videos. Um, he, he wasn't laughing about type 1 at all. I mean, he was in training for the Air Force and when he was diagnosed, it changed his life. It was not at all. Um, I mean, you could never prepare for type 1. But imagine how difficult it is to be in one of the few fields where they will say to you, you have type 1, you cannot do this, right? We always say it can't stop you, but sometimes it can. And Neil was almost at the end of his training after years of hard work when type 1 showed its ugly face. Here's my interview with Neil Greathouse. Neil, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I love your videos. I'm so excited to talk to you. It is going to be crazy. I have no idea. We're, this is, get ready. Just buckle up. <laughs> There's no telling where this thing ends up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny you say buckle up because I want to start by asking about, you know, your diagnosis story. And you were in the Air Force when this happened? Yes. Tell us what happened. Yeah. So I had actually spent uh, four years of doing uh, ROTC, getting ready for um, a job flying on board AWACS planes. And those planes have these this gigantic dish that's on top of it. It looks like some kind of a weird spaceship. And it was a very prestigious job. I'd worked really, really hard to get to it and was in the process of going through flight training. And there were three of us together that were roommates that had been together for almost a year, very, very close. And I started to get sick, but I didn't know what was going on. Um, as a 19 year old, you don't pay very much attention to your, <laughs> to what's going on around you sometimes, but apparently they'll let you get in a plane. I don't know. That's ter terrible math, but I just could, I didn't notice that things were, were changing. I just noticed there was always a weird taste in my mouth and I, could not stop drinking water or, well, if I was lucky, it was water, but I would go in between each one of the classes we were taking and I would just go get a, a Coke, a Dr. Pepper or whatever, and just literally just chug it. And so we had just come through a bunch of flight training, survival training, all kinds of stuff, all the hard stuff. And then they put us in these chambers where they, you practice it's uh, hypoxia, high pressure, high altitude. If your plane loses cabin pressure, um, everything you see in the movies is wrong because if the plane loses cabin pressure and you start to fall out of the sky, the air literally turns into a cloud inside and you've got about four to five seconds before most people will pass oh, out. Wow. But they would train us in these big chambers time after time after time. I can't tell you how many times we were in there and they would train you to continue to function after the loss of cabin pressure. They called it uh, time of useful consciousness. It was um, our goal was to get into the teens as far as seconds, so you could get a mask on, help the person next to you, whatever. But we would just spend all day passing out, and, um, and it was super fun. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> but we we signed forms. You know, everybody signed forms, and you worked really, really hard to get there in that job. And I noticed something was going on inside of me, but I couldn't quite tell. But well, we passed that course, went on to the next one, and we're going through electronics training and all sorts of other things. And then all of a sudden, I walked by someone that I had gone through basic training with my, almost a year ago. And in that, I was literally walking past him, hadn't seen him. He goes, man, it's like, you are skinny. And I was like, what? 
it didn't even register to me. And then I, I, I walk back home and look in the mirror and I'm flexing and trying and whatever. And I was like, yeah, I think I am skinny. But, and you're a thin guy as I see pictures oh, of you. Oh, no, way for now. thin. Way for thin. Like a, like a Trisket. Super <laughs> like a wheat thin. Very thin. Whatever. No one's called me thin in years. But <laughs> so. But, but it, and, and how much weight lose. had you lost at that point? It had to have been. I, it couldn't I, have been I probably that lost much. 30. 30 oh, pounds. Wow. And yeah, so it was, and I have a photo of me. We just got done doing some hurricane training and I have a photo of me, um, holding up my boots, pouring water out. And it's the last picture I have of me before I went in the hospital. And it was February 14th, 1992. It was a three day weekend, Valentine's day. Um, my girlfriend, who's my wife now at the time had sent me just a, a package of cookies <laughs> And I had eaten a bunch of them and had drunk a bunch of orange juice or whatever. I just got really, really sick and just could not stop throwing up. But I was in full, you know, DKA. I just didn't know it. And we were walking back from class that night. And I remember looking at my roommates. And when you work so hard to get to a certain point in that program, you just don't want to wash out because there's a good chance you'll never make it back yeah. in. And so I just said, all right, we'll just keep going. And I, I, I stopped walked to the side of the road, sat down on the curb and said, guys, I can't, I, I literally cannot put one foot in front of the other. You got to call an ambulance. And so they, you know, they, they knew something was wrong. We all knew it. You know, they, we've been together for so long, but we just all agreed. Even if, you know, if I, if my leg falls off, just don't tell anyone and we'll hobble along and we'll be okay. <laughs> we just all agreed, you know, it's, we're in this together. And then uh, ambulance came, they took me to the ER. Uh, they didn't check my blood sugar right away, but they got me some fluids. They said, you're really dehydrated. And then, they, they did a finger stick, and next thing I know, I'm flying up to ICU. My, my blood sugar was 1,500. Oh, my gosh. And I had been like that for who knows how long. They said, there's no way. How long have you been like this? And it was three months. Oh, my gosh. And uh, I was just – it was a roller coaster. And so I went blind for about a week, couldn't see a thing. Uh, and the, the first person that came up to see me was one of – one of the, the officers in charge of the program, he came and he was sitting at the foot of the bed, very blurry. And he said, Hey, you know, the, your flight is moving on without you. Your, your job is, is done. You can't fly. You have type one diabetes. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I literally had no clue what it was. And hey, so before doctors, I let you go on though, before I let you go yeah. on with that, I'm just curious again with the mindset, because I can only imagine, you know, never having gone through something like that. As you said, my leg falls off. Don't tell anybody. You know, you real. I mean, I know you're kidding, but that yeah. mindset of we've got to get through this. Look how hard we've worked to get here. So when you got on the scale and you saw how much weight yeah. you'd lost, did, yeah. God, part of your brain kind of said, "Don't tell anybody." But part of your oh, brain gosh, thought, yes. "This is an emergency." I mean, I just yeah. is, is that what was going on? Yep. So I wrestled with it because I knew something wasn't right, but I seemed to be able to function somewhat like I normally was. So like I can I can muscle my way through this. And you just kind of you just kind of put your head down and grit your teeth and just push through it and and say I'm gonna treat tomorrow like it's day one all over again and we'll just get to the end of that one and it, I did it literally for three months and uh, just it got to the point where I, I couldn't yeah. physically do it anymore um, and and that's when you know that's when the, the job changed and everything hit and uh, doctors came in you know they gave me a few instructions back then it was just it was uh, shots so I got I don't even remember. It was a, a regular, I think it was regular R insulin and then NPH. They gave me two different kinds and no, no kidding. This is, this is, I wish I still had the piece of paper, but they wrote down on a piece of notebook paper, a lined piece of notebook paper, my sliding scale and gave it to me. And I put it in my meter and they gave me some syringes and some insulin. And they said, okay, you, you can, you can go now, but you only, you have a choice between two jobs. They said you, you could be a, a a bus driver or or a garbage collector. One of those two. Wait, they wait, said you two can't. jobs in the military or two jobs? Yep, oh. two jobs in the military. Yeah, period. Because I was I signed up. I was in this for the long haul. This was a this was a lifelong dream for oh, me, geez. and I was on. I was living my dream. I was going for it. So that's why it was such a huge kind of you know it's like we threw the emergency brake on and started slide, sliding out of control and i realized okay this everything's different and then you know a month or two after that uh i went back home it the those two months were very tricky because the military uh they have to do a study to figure out what percentage of disability you have if they're ever going to cover any of it and is it service connected those are the two things they have to find out 
So it was service connected, which means it happened while I was in the military as a result of something in the military. That's number one. And then number two, you have to be at least 19% disabled. If you're 18%, they won't give you, you don't get, you get no insulin. You don't get any coverage, nothing. And so we literally had to go to court, but it wasn't like something I was pushing. I just, it was part of the process. They're trying to determine how disabled are you? Oh, and, pardon, and I got it. Yeah, pardon my ignorance. Is there a formula for that? Are there different conditions yeah. that, well, this is five, this is 20, yep. average them out? Wow. Yes. Wow. And, and, and the, the, the straw that tipped me over was DKA, mm. um, ketoacidosis. They said, okay, that is what, that's, you've been in, it wasn't like, oh, my blood sugar's in the 200s. They said, you've been in pain for this long. You probably did some kind of damage to your body. It is as a result of this training. And so they gave me 19% and they they sent me home. So, you know, college is paid for. But, I mean, I'd already done all that. I'd already done all the all the work. And it was just now, what is your career going to be? How, you know, what do you do from there? So it was definitely a big shift. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> you think you're on one track and all of a sudden you've hydroplaned and you're and you're not anymore. So it was really interesting. How did you bounce back from that? Um, as, you know, I mean, gosh, you're 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 yeah. now you're a pastor, you're a filmmaker, you're married, you're a dad. Obviously, it, it takes yeah. something to go from that devastating bedside yep. news to where you are now. Yeah, um, I'll be honest with you, it it, it didn't happen quickly for me. Mm. Um, I went back home, changed you know changed a major in college, and, and went for computer technology because it's something. It just seemed to be the, a, a good field to be in. I had no real desire to go do computer networking. I was studying to you know, become a, a CNA, and it was it would make really good money. But in the process, I took a couple of classes on creative writing. It just stumbled on there. There may be something there. I attribute a lot of that to my parents, my upbringing. They're just very uh, well-educated people and they're fairly creative as well. So they just, you know, they always push that. And, and as a process of that, I had started volunteering in the church where my, my wife was attending and it just clicked. We started doing student ministry together and something clicked. There was an outlet or an Avenue. And for me, sarcasm is just like, <laughs> you know, it's like, that's the best. And so just being sarcastic about it, that was uh, it was kind of a, a release, but I'll be completely honest with you. It, it took me seven years. I didn't own it or really even own up to the fact that I need to start taking care of myself for seven years after that diagnosis. And it was this, it was this. Uh, I was I was joking around. It was like this shame spiral. I was just going down because it was it was not fun, and I was trying to hide the fact that I had it. So I would just take as much insulin as I thought I needed. Wouldn't check as often as I needed to, and I was kind of like, I'm young. I can. I still had that mentality of I'll just muscle through this. But after so many highs and lows and just kind of being ridiculous, I said, okay, I, I need to take care of myself. And, and when that clicked in, it definitely settled me down. And then uh, filmmaking and um, shooting videos and editing and all that kind of stuff just was a creative release. It was an outlet for me. And and then it eventually turned into a way to encourage people. Yeah, and I, uh, I didn't I didn't start off that way. Well, that's and I, I really appreciate your honesty, because I think sometimes there's this idea that if you if you have trouble or you have issues, or you're not, quote, taking care of yourself, right. then you never will. <laughs> and yeah. I, I can't even imagine I don't have type one myself. I have other stuff, you know, and I'm not a size two. So it's hard to be perfect in anything. <laughs> right. But I, I appreciate that. And did you know anybody else with type one? And do you think maybe if you had no. it, it might have been easier? It, it I, I know it would have been easier because I was trying to hide. There's a part of me that didn't know any other. I didn't know anyone else who had type one. But I also didn't want anyone to know that I had it either. Because mm. it was it was a very because uh, you have to explain it then. And then what would end up happening is, you know, you're at a family reunion and somebody's great aunt comes over to you and, and knocks a piece of cake out of your hand and says, you shouldn't eat that. And I'm thinking, lady, I'm going to we're going to this is going down. How do you feel about chokeholds? Because you just don't want it. You don't you don't want to want to be in those scenarios. Yeah. So I just tried to hide it. Yeah. And if I had, I, I know that I would have learned more faster if I hadn't um, just kind of kept it myself for a long time, wow. for sure.
So, um, bringing it back then, those seven years, I don't want to gloss over them, but you're, yep. um, I assume, you know, you still, as you said, it was, she was your girlfriend when this happened. Now your yeah. wife, three kids. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, when did you become a pastor? So I, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think about me. It's just an interesting combination. Five. Once you've seen your videos and then you have, you know, <laughs> and you've, and you've, uh, you know, read some of your stuff. It's, I didn't, I didn't go there right away. So sorry. Yeah. Didn't interrupt. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing too, is I didn't, I never wanted to browbeat anybody with it. You know, I mean, people treat religion and going to church and all that kind of stuff. Very, it's, it's, uh, you know, it can be private, but it can also be something that you're proud of, but you also don't want to, you know, be that guy, you know, who's just thumping people over the head with a Bible. So I just never wanted to do that. But it came through the process of being in student ministry and spending enough time with high school students and college students who were in those pivotal years of making major life decisions and helping them navigate some of that. And honestly, just hit their potential. That's all we really ever wanted to do. And in that process, we just fell in love with ministry and it turned into, you know, I, I mean, I'd already gone to college for something completely different. Yeah. So all of a sudden now you're, you're trying to figure out how do I train for this on top of it? And it, the those two things crossed over. I, I was doing a, just a, a regular marketplace job. I was in sales, working at a, a couple of different places, and it uh, that I was able to go to work at the church in more of the media and design side of things. And ultimately, we ended up owning a business with several guys and a bunch of contract people all across the country. And we were doing really, really well for ourselves. But they're kind of crossroads where we had to pick one or the other. And I always thought they needed to be separate and didn't realize, wait a minute. Uh, you could actually do some of this, the video and the, you know, the live sketches and all that kind of stuff. But then it's also, it is ministry at the same time. That's fantastic. So how did, how did you start making those videos though? As you said, it was a company and you <laughs> had this creative, but, but the, the, the diabetes videos are, are different. Yeah, they absolutely <laughs> are. They, <laughs> different is the right way to say that. I don't even, <laughs> I, I can't even describe them sometimes. Uh, I, I think what happened was, we had moved from Columbus, Ohio down uh, because of our job. We moved down here to a church that was planning, you know, new churches and we came to central Arkansas and it had been a long time since we had been around people who did not know that I actually had type one. And in the first two or three weeks of moving down here, we had so many people want to know what, what, it, what is the insulin pump? Like, why are you carrying a pager? Are you scrubbing in for surgery? Are you getting a lot of pages? <laughs> you know, there was that. And, and, you know, I'll look at them and slowly roll my eyes and then have to explain it. And I thought, you know what? Let me just make a video that explains it. And it was on the anniversary. So it was February 14th. I had about a half hour free time. And I just grabbed a camera, sat in an office, and just made a video and put it on YouTube. And it um, it just kind of picked up. I made about five or six other ones. But where it really clicked in was there was a, a family that lived about an hour away from where we lived. And their son was about 10 years old. And he just got diagnosed with type 1. And he watched all those videos because he, he was in a rough spot. You know, he was very upset. And he was in a rough spot and it just encouraged the family. And I realized, okay, this isn't just a creative outlet for me. Maybe they could actually help somebody else. So how could I tow that line between the two? How could it be funny? And then how could it also help maybe bring some information? Now, there's a part of the story. That I actually, I very rarely tell this. And oh, this well, is, tell us. So, okay. So <laughs> what happened was is Medtronic found those videos. I did five of them. Medtronic, and this is, this is every bit of seven, eight years ago at least, Medtronic found these videos. I got a phone call one day, and it is, um, it's, they just leave a voicemail, and it was like, hey, this is so-and-so from Medtronic. We need to talk to you right away. And I was like, what in the, why in the world would they want to? I don't know. I don't, they got the wrong number. I don't know anybody from Medtronic. <laughs> well, then she sends, a, she sends an email, and she said, hey, I need to talk to you about your videos. Now, my brain, I'm immediately going, Oh, I'm going to jail. I'm actually holding up Medtronic pumps in every one of these videos. I'm like, I need to hit the delete button as fast as I can. <laughs> but on a, is coming. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, just change. Yeah, we're <laughs> we're gonna go into witness protection. So I, I I thought, wait a minute, let me just call this lady, and she said, 
she goes, I'm, I'm actually in charge of, uh, I forget what it was like patient education or something. It was the marketing advertising side of Medtronic. And she said, I was walking through one of our call centers. There were about eight or nine of our people that were crowded around a computer and they were laughing. And she said, I'm the boss. But when I walked through, they saw me and they all kind of straightened up and moved it. And she said, I, I asked them what they were watching and they were all sitting there watching one of your videos. So I sat down, watched all five of them, and she said, would you be interested in doing some videos for us? And I said, sure, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. But, yeah, I'm not in this for the money. It doesn't make any difference to me. I'm going to make them one way or another. She said, okay. She goes, would it help you if we – because I had an old pump at the time. It was like a hand-cranked – you know, it took like a a (laughs) nine-volt battery or something. I'm not like I had a a paper clip and tinfoil together. It was bad. She said, we'll give you one of the newer ones. Will that help? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that that will help. I'm trying to maintain my – you know, like not not break down crying. Yeah, yeah, sure. So – uh I made how many videos, four videos. They actually made me send them photos. They had a website and this was all on Medtronic's page. And there were two, two areas of Medtronic that needed to sign off on the videos themselves. And they, keep in mind, they are, they're the least clinically um, accurate videos that anyone will ever watch. It was all based <laughs> off of just let's just joke around for a little bit. You got a pump, and and people are going to think it's weird. I mean, it was it was kind of funny. They had me scheduled to speak at a huge conference in New Orleans, and it was going to be this launch, right? So this thing was coming, but legal and um, clinical were the two areas that had to sign off. Legal signed off, and they said put this disclaimer at the end of the video, and you're fine clinical said no mm. and it's they, they were mad that it was it was too tongue-in-cheek it was too sarcastic and too funny and it felt like I was making fun of their life's work and I, and I said listen I, people are making fun of it anyways let's just embrace that <laughs> and and just go with it because I think your company is so big maybe it could look a little more human if we if we could just do this together and he said okay what are your ideas and I'm not listen Stacy I I, I I have a whole paper on the pitch. I I pitched this idea. I said, let me come out there to your factory or your headquarters or wherever it is. And let me, let me do a tour of the building with like with on on camera and just show it. But I said, let's Willy Wonka and the Charlotte fact chocolate factory, this thing up a little bit. Let's have fun and show them that you're real people. Like you get to the front desk and instead of like a, a bowl full of jelly beans or suckers at the front. It's just insulin pumps. You know, you have so many of these in every color. And then you go back to the testing lab and everybody's testing flavored insulins and scented this and that. And they, they stared at me like I was like, I, I, did you just get off the heroin boat? Like, where did you come from? And I, so I said, so you're telling me no. And they said, no. And they shut it down immediately. Nothing, none of the videos, none of it ever made it oh, to no. air, never made it to, they have them. I don't know where they are. So I said, okay, all right. And I honestly, I shut it down after that. I was like, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm pushing this. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Wild. And so I just backed off. Do you still wear well, a Medtronic it, pump? I'm going to let you continue. I'm just curious. Uh, yes, I do. Actually, it's the only pump I've ever had is Medtronic. I'm just trying to recall. Um, I, I think in the videos, I still see them. That's why. Yeah, I hot glued this one together. I'm not even kidding you. I literally hot glued uh, <laughs> part of this thing back on because it, it was it was coming apart. I I tried to use bathroom caulking around the edges oh, to fix part Lord. of it, but it it's it kind of worked. It's waterproof now. To say <laughs> so I can, if I drop it, it's it's no big deal. <laughs> so, uh, so you took those ideas though, and then said, "Well, I'm still going to yeah. do this in some way, shape, or form," because you knew I, it, you I knew did. you'd connected. Yes, because the the responses and what was happening is somebody wouldn't they they would they would give a thumbs up on YouTube, but then they would email me and I was getting emails from parents or from people and they were just saying, listen, I haven't laughed about this thing in a year. And I just finally laughed for the first time. Uh, Thank you. I I think you get it. And so I thought, all right, wait a minute. Let's try. Let's try a project. I said, what if on Instagram and at that time it was 15 seconds. I said, what if I could post a video every single day for 365 days, post something that will either encourage somebody, make them laugh, or at least let them understand somebody out there gets it. And I said, maybe we can learn something from each other. Maybe we could learn how to take better care of ourselves because I was getting better diabetes advice 
on social media than I was even through my my endocrinologist at the time. Now, since then, I've gotten a much better one, and she's great. But that, there was this community that I didn't know existed, and I just started one day. And it was every single day for an entire year, and I was just floored at – the response, not, not for followers, not for, none of that matters to me. It's great to be a part of it, but I needed it just as much as they did. It was an outlet for me just to kind of let off steam and, and learn from a lot of people. So some of my favorite people in the type one community came through social media and there are people that I'll text once or twice a week that are just out there all over the world because of a connection through that. It is an amazing community. It's just, it's it's incredible. I know. So I I have a couple of questions about the videos. (laughs) When when was the first time that you said to yourself, this was the dumbest idea I ever had 365 (laughs) days. What was I thinking? Was it in, was it on day two or on day 200? Or Actually, never. I don't think I don't think I'm the one who said it. I think it was my wife. It was about a <laughs> about a month into it. She goes, "Really? Are we going to do this for another 11 months?" She goes, "I don't know that I care about diabetes." And I actually I, I got to a point about a month into it. I thought, Am I, "Is that what I'm going to be known as? Is the the BDS guy? Like, is that really what I want to? Am I embarrassing my children?" And we had like a we had a family meeting at dinner, just sitting around. I had to say, "Listen, if this is annoying, I'll just stop." But I think it helps. I think so. I just included them in it. They came along with me and made videos. They helped. Uh, I kept it very low key. I, I tried to either shoot it with my phone or a GoPro. And if I couldn't edit it on my phone, I wasn't going to do it. So I, I actually was able to show my son how I how I was shooting and editing and kind of gave him an idea for it. He's he actually will start college next year. Mm-hmm. And he is going to go for digital filmmaking. Just so it's it's kind of one of those things where if you take your kids along with you, they'll you know you'll you'll learn through some of those experiences. But there were a lot of days where it was just like another I'm gonna another video. How many times can I complain about the alarms? Uh-huh. On my, you know what I mean. So you just you had to get really really creative with it. Well, and the, the next thing I wrote down about the videos was the word kids, because they are in a few of your videos. Yeah. And, um, you know, you have, you have teenagers, right? They're all teenagers, yep, the three of them. They are. And yes. they don't, they don't see my, I, I just want to know your secret. Cause mine would be like, uh, again, <laughs> like roll their eyes, you know, and I'm very careful. And I know you are too, because there's not, if you haven't seen the videos, it's not like he's giving personal information about his kids. Right, or anything like right. that. And I try very hard not to talk about my son too much because you know, it, this is his story, not mine, but I'm right. a parent of a kid with type one. So I'm kind of careful about what I share to some extent. So they were they were okay with it after that talk. Um, yes, and it wasn't just a it wasn't just a talk that did it. Part of this is just it's the the parenting side of it. I first of all I wouldn't post something without getting their permission first, and they knew that I wouldn't I wouldn't go against that. And then the other thing was is if someone ever sent me a message that said, "Hey, I just wanted to thank you. My my son has this." And he's been dealing with it for whatever. I just wanted you to know it really means a lot. I would show that to them so they understood the why behind it. Because the what will get really, really frustrating over the time that you're doing it. And if they understood the why, then you have enough, you know, m- muscle inside to be able to just say, okay, we, we need to keep doing this. So I think there, we learned a lot of valuable lessons, but we had to relearn those time and time again. And don't get me wrong. There were a lot of eye rolling moments. There were a lot of them where there's like, Oh God, can we not just eat dinner? Do we have to do this while we're driving to the gas station? It was just those moments. It was, it was constant, but it's fun. Oh, that's great. Um, do you have any videos that you, you really liked that you did, whether they got whatever response they got that you just had a lot of fun doing either that one (laughs) every day or any others, because I just shared the low where you're singing along to all the low songs Yeah, and I'll, I'll link that up. Um, (laughs) but it's so funny and I shared it with somebody who I thought needed a laugh. Do you have any that stick out for you? Yeah, there are, there have been a few and they weren't the ones that I thought there were some that I thought were just absolutely hysterical. There is a couple of them that, uh, I thought were going to be more helpful than what they were. And they just, they didn't go anywhere. And there's others that kind of blindside you. And, and the ones where I am very real and honest about maybe the day I was having are the ones that tend to get more of a reaction. People love to laugh. They're okay with that, but they're definitely, 
a lot more connected to you when you're just transparent and real. They don't need the fluff. They just need somebody to be real with them. And they, they really connected during those. The, the video that I am most proud of so far isn't even on Instagram. It's on YouTube. And it's a, it's a short film. It's, it's um, about 26 minutes long. And it's called Type 1, Day 1. And about halfway through the process of year one doing these videos, I had an idea, literally woke up in the middle of the night and sat down on the bathroom floor and started writing things out on my phone. And I texted a friend of mine who was halfway across the world. I said, I think I have an idea for something. It might really help a lot of people out. Can I call you? And he, he did not answer <laughs> because it was because uh, it was 3 a.m. So he, he called back the next day and we talked about it. And basically what it was is there's a there's a movie um, and it has I think it has Drew Barrymore and uh, Adam Sandler. And it. it's called 50 First Dates. Oh, yeah. This wasn't the there wasn't the the reason for it, but it's the best example I'd come up with. And there's this scene at the end where this girl has amnesia and she wakes up every morning. And she doesn't know who she is, doesn't remember how she got there, but she has a VHS cassette right next to her bed, and it just says, play me. And she pushes it in the, v the VCR, and she would watch it, and it's kind of a recap. And it was a reminder of how they got there and what's next, and you know, your, your life is going to be amazing. And I, I realized every day somebody is finding out that they have a diagnosis that they don't understand. And it sounds terrifying. And I remember what day one was like for me. I'll never forget it. I remember exactly what I was thinking. I'll remember the hopelessness that was there. And I, I thought, wait a minute, what if we as a community could get as many people together and shoot this short film kind of like a documentary, but not really. It's more of an encouragement and let other people with type one encourage someone who's finding out. Cause what you're going to do it, when you find out now you're going to get on Google and you're going to Google, I've got type one. What does that look like? And this is the same thing. So what if we could put it out on YouTube and if somebody finds out they've got type one, they can watch this. They'll know that yes, there's a learning curve. Yes, there are a lot of variables that are going to take a while to figure out, but look at all these people who have been where you are and you're not alone. That was the number one thing is just not being alone in it. And then could we talk to a couple doctors? Could we talk to a couple of you know nurse educators? Could we go across the country? And we literally did. Um, we, we went all the way out to San Francisco, San Diego, um, all over the place from one corner of the U S to the other talking to different people who had type one. We follow two of them, literally one of them on the day he found out he has type one, went to the doctor with him and it just encouraged a lot of people. And I, that's, that, that's the one that I'm the most proud of uh, so far. Yeah. And I've seen it and I will link it up. It is, it is, it's exceptional because there's really nothing like it. And, you know, obviously it's well done, but, but it's unique and it's so necessary. I'm so glad you brought that up. Was, was that done in concurrence with Beyond Type 1? I know you're a council member with them now, or is it something that they yes. helped with the word? Because that's how I found out about it when it came yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, so what happened is uh, after, after the, the 3 a.m., you know, writing down on a napkin in the bathroom <laughs> idea in that moment, and you wake up and you're looking at it, you're like, what did I write? What is this? I must have been out of my mind. I, I went through the notes, and I probably spent about two weeks putting together a plan. Around that time, Beyond Type 1 and I had connected on social media a little bit. I actually didn't even find this out. I've never said this either. I just found out a couple weeks ago. I'm terrible on Facebook, but I actually had a Facebook message a week before I called them where where Sarah Lucas had sent me a message and she said, hey, we found your videos. Just want you to know what you're doing is great. If we can ever help out, let us know. I literally had no <laughs> clue until about two weeks ago. I actually just direct messaged them and I said, hey, I have this idea. I would love to call you guys. I love your sense of design. I think where you're headed is great. And I just want to be able to partner with somebody. I'm going to do this one way or another. If you want to do it with me, let's go. And we got on a, a phone call, and it was like we were family instantly. And so they helped out, absolutely. They helped us just guide the whole thing, get connected to the right people. They aggregated all the different stories. They, they've been amazing, absolutely. That's fantastic. Would you do something like that again? Yes. <laughs> so this, this summer, we are following 
Bike Beyond is happening on June 1st, and we have 22 riders, I think, 22 or 21 riders. They're not professional cyclists. One or two of them are, but they are going to start in New York City, and they are going to ride for 10 weeks all the way across the country, and they're going to end in San Francisco. Every one of them has type 1, except for one. There's a girl. And um, she's 17 years older because she's a minor. She can't ride with us, but her mom is going to ride with her. She does not have type one. Talk about a mom of the year award. <laughs> and, and, so the... Neil, it's funny. You know, you and I, um, we talked before the podcast here, but, you know, we don't go into great detail. We don't do a pre-conversation. So the, the kid you're talking about, the 17-year-old, I just met her because she no and her mom live in Charlotte. Yeah, her name's oh, Abby, wow. Small yeah. World. We were at a yep. great um, a JDRF event, actually, to get all the kids together, That's and right. I got to meet her, so that was terrific. And um, oh. and I'm going to be involved in Bike Beyond, or at least Come the, podcast, on. the podcast is going to be involved. So That's no awesome. announcement yet, but yeah, we'll be talking. Yes. It's going to be amazing. I definitely That's am great. not going to be on a bike, but, <laughs> but the microphone is open. So I'm excited. So you're traveling with them all summer long? We, we are going to make a full feature documentary. It'll uh, be about an hour and a half by the time it's done. We will tell all of their stories, the whole trip, and we'll weave it all together. And on uh, World Diabetes Day in 2017, we will release this short film. Oh, that's great. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's it's amazing to look at the dedication of, of so many people to whatever they're doing. I mean, they're going to be riding the bike. You're making a <laughs> film. I'm yep. sitting here in, in comfort, you know, talking on the microphone. Amazing. <laughs> but yeah, we all, but we all, we all we, have something to do. We're all doing it. Yeah. Yeah, that absolutely. That is fantastic. I love being on type one. All right, good. So we'll be able to follow up and hopefully talk to you again this summer when that yes. kicks off. You know, when I wonder if there's anybody listening right now too. When I'm talking about doing your part or you know jumping in, I, I don't want anyone to feel like they're obligated. You know, certainly we're all we're all right. following our own paths here. But when you, it's it's like you said earlier when you did the videos with me with the podcast and when I started my blog, which I think three people read years ago. I did it for <laughs> me because it helps yes. so much. Do you find, you know, when you're reaching out to other people? You just get it back so yes. much. I know it sounds cheesy, yep. but it's just so important that we don't keep this to ourselves. Yeah, it's it changes your perspective for a little bit. So even if there are only three people reading it, and, and, and in reality, it's going to grow if your heart is in it. But if if you start it off for the right reasons, your perspective changes. Because I know I can get um, – I could be woe is me about my, my blood – glucose levels or carbohydrates and exercise and all that kind of stuff. But when I take my focus off of me for a little while and on somebody else is when things finally click for me and maybe nothing legitimately changes for me. <laughs> I mean, it still is going to be there. Like Dexcom is going to scream at me again tomorrow. I know it is. It's no big deal. But when I'm focused on somebody else, I'm not as worried about me. And that's what it does for me is, is yeah, it might be a video. It might be a, a post, um, I just got done running the Little Rock Half Marathon, and I learned a few things on this one. I've done so many of these stupid half marathons. I just, <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? What? This is ridiculous, Neil. Get over it. But there's something every couple of years about pushing yourself and getting out there and encouraging a few other people to have it. It's just that. It's just, I, I don't ever want to sit still on this thing. I don't want to be the guy that could have done something and just, nah, I'm, I'm just going to worry about me. I, I can't live that way. Do you ever let your mind think back to the Air Force? Is that still a disappointment for you? Oh, I'm sorry honestly, to ask. I'm just, honestly, uh, yes. I'm yeah, so nosy. No, no I, I, I actually do think about it. I think about it all the time. Um, I know that m I would not have chose what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I just, I know I wouldn't have. There's no way. So, but, but that major life change. It's, it wasn't long after that, that that my career path changed and my focus changed. And I, I feel like there's a part of me that just had to give up that other side of that, that other dream. Uh, and obviously not to sound so cliche as well, but um, I mean, I love what I'm doing right now. But if I could be doing a video in a plane with type one, <laughs> I would, I would put all of those together, ultimately just send me to space. Like that's, that was the, that was the long term dream. That's about as geeky as I could ever get. But I do think about the limitations that that has. And, and maybe that's why I try so hard to not let anyone else limit me. Not like, 
<laughs> not like that guy walking around. Don't you tell me what I can do. <laughs> but it's you know, but, but it's it's more of a, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this or <laughs> look what I can do. You know what I mean? Like it's just at some point it does get a little bit overwhelming. But I, I love to at least push myself in that. I do think about flying. Um, I, I do think about that lifestyle that I wanted so badly. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to make the most of, of what I've got and not worry about what you – know, I, I can't change that. There's nothing I can do about it. But I'm not going to lie to you. I do think about it. I think about it all the time. I just don't – I don't think about it for a long time <laughs> in, one, in any one moment or else I'd just be sitting in a parking lot on the curb by myself staring and just like what in the world? What could I – you know what I mean? Like I don't I – don't, is it the glass half full or half empty? Yeah. That's really the way I look at it. Well, that's I, – I, I hate to leave it there, but – and I, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't make you stare in the parking lot all day long. No, no that's great no, though. No, no, no. I'm so glad you, you were able to make some time because truly, um, I really do love your videos and I love what you're doing. So thank you. Oh, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. More information on everything we talked about. I'll link to Neil's Instagram. Um, Bike Beyond, yeah, be sure to stay tuned for more on that. I'm very excited about being involved with Bike Beyond this summer, and it's fun to find out. I mean, we didn't, as you heard, we didn't plan that. Neither one of us knew that the other was going to be involved. So uh, I'll have to talk to my producer about doing better uh, pre-interviews here. Um, Yeah, I am my producer. I'll also link up uh, the information about Hockey Camp, the NHL's new hockey camp for kids with type 1 up in Canada. And, of course, Jeremy's trip that I mentioned at the top of the show about traveling to the national parks this spring with type 1 diabetes. So lots going on this week, lots more to come. Hey, if you like what you heard today, please share it with somebody touched by type 1 diabetes. Um, sign up for the newsletter. Every week a newsletter goes out, not only with the show, of course, but with the link of the week, something I include that is easier read than listened to if you want to find out more. Um, It's usually a deeper dive or something that you can sign up for, and that goes into the newsletter. You can sign up right on the website or go to Facebook, and Diabetes Connections is easy to find that way as well. Let me know what you're up to. Great stories in our community. Far too many, frankly, to feature. I have a list of people I want to talk to for this year, and it's already... I got more than 100 people on the list, so hopefully we'll be doing this podcast for a while. (laughs) There are so many terrific stories in our community. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.